unquestionably the most important and significant dynasty in British history. They may have ruled for only three generations and a mere 118 years, but they fundamentally shaped our sense of our national identity. innovations of the Tudor era was the establishment of a standing navy. For the first time, Britain became an island fortress rather than an adjunct to mainland Europe. And this was mainly Henry VIII's doing. This is the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's flagship launched just two years after his accession. It saw active service until two years before the end of his reign. And then, catastrophe happened. On the 19th of July, 1545, Henry VIII came down to Portsmouth to survey his fleet in action against the French in a fierce battle that was raging in the Solent. The French had attacked with a fleet of 324 ships. Far more ships than the later famous Spanish Armada. It was the greatest foreign threat of Henry VIII's reign. In the midst of the fighting, the English flagship started to sink. She'd either been hit by French cannon, or more likely was overladen with crew and guns. A great weight overbalanced her. 500 men went down with the ship. Henry VIII watched on helplessly. For years afterwards, the tops of her masts could be seen at high tide. A grim reminder of the tragedy. But despite the loss, Henry VIII's navy had managed to see off the invaders. England's place in the world was becoming increasingly important. And that was partly, largely as a result of its increasing maritime influence. This book of accounts from the year 1514 charts exactly what Henry VIII was spending on his navy, and it's seriously impressive. We have these lists of names and these lists of payments made, and this is a crucial change because before this point, ships had really not been that important and hadn't been repaired. Henry VII had left between five and seven ships to his son, but when Henry VIII died, he left a navy of 57 ships. This map from the 1540s or 1550s shows exactly why England was becoming so strategically important. It wasn't locked within Europe, but it was on the edge, facing out towards the new world. That new world was so new, they hadn't even discovered all its contours yet. But England was in a prime place to make the most of that opportunity. After the loss of Calais in 1558, the Tudors turn their attentions to that new world. It's under the Tudors that we see the circumnavigation of the globe by Sir Francis Drake, that we see Raleigh sending men to Virginia, the beginning of the East India Company, and Dr John Dee claiming that there could be such a thing as the British Empire. Empire was first pursued by the Tudors. It was financed by the Tudors. It was a Tudor enterprise. But it didn't end with the dynasty in 1603. In fact, it continued for the next 400 years through the Napoleonic Wars and the two world wars. All around me is that legacy. Behind me is the world's most famous ship, HMS Victory, and Portsmouth is still home to the modern navy all of which was possible because of the programme of expansion that was first embarked upon by the Tudors. Of course, that's not the only impact of the Tudors' empirical legacy that's still with us today. When Henry VIII stood here in 1545, watching the Mary Rose go down, it was as the king who'd already cemented another pivotal part of national identity, 
This was the king who, in the act of supremacy in 1534, had broken with the Church of Rome, creating the Church of England and cutting England off from Europe, both politically and spiritually. The Navy, Empire, the creation of an outward-looking, cosmopolitan, maritime nation. The Church of England, Protestantism, extraordinary architecture, literature and art. The Tudors planted and watered the seeds of those things that make Britain, Britain. The Tudors were the dynasty that made us.